a couple more minutes, but um, I just wanted to welcome you guys to our monthly meeting. Um, usually we have a, a slew of people coming in today and we've had some special attention because of you guys attending. So it's really great. Um, and I don't know if you guys want to give a brief introduction or do you want me to speak about it first uh, and then we can dive into the presentation. We have um, in our presentation who we are and what we did. Right. Great, so I won't be redundant there. Um, why don't we go ahead and dive in, people will roll in and um, catch up as well. And I just wanted to make sure you're okay with, we're recording this, if you're okay if we put this on our YouTube page and spread the word. All right, great. Um, I'm gonna share my screen, Danielle, if that's okay. And then yeah. I can start the presentation. Um, slideshow, just let me know if everybody can see it. And um, if we are a small group attending, feel free to jump in with questions. Uh, but if a lot more people come, maybe we can keep the questions at the end. And Danielle, if you can uh, facilitate some of the questions that come in to the chat, absolutely. because maybe we won't be able to. Yeah, absolutely. It looks right. great. Who are we, Shari? <laughs> I'm the uh, director of the Environmental Justice Department at Mural Arts. I'm an artist, and um, I started Trash Academy with some other folks in 2016 in a vacant lot in South Philly. <laughs> and I am uh, Gabar Markarian. I am a design strategist, but uh, previously I was a landscape architect for more than 10 years and uh, urban designer. And then I decided to shift careers and go into strategy. Um, I've worked with Shari since 2016 in the environmental justice department, but I've also worked at the healthy materials lab at Parsons, the new school. Um, yeah. Oh, sorry. That's so um, trash slow and internet. Um, I just want to give you a minute to look at this slide, who we are, because we complicate the issue of trash, but we go through innovative processes to do that. Um, and really it's about shifting attitudes and really taking action and supporting action as opposed to, it's not an intellectual exercise for us. It's about doing things and changing things. Let's go to the next slide. Yeah. It takes a moment, I don't know why. Kamar, should I share a screen instead? Uh, yes, try. Yeah, maybe. My internet is like very iffy right now. Okay, so you have to turn, you have to stop sharing mm -hmm. for me to do it. Um, turn off my video too. Give me a second. We discussed this, that this might happen. I, I don't like being the driver on the presentations, but I will. Okay, here we go. All right, so this is a plastic bag implosion that you see on your screen. And we use an implosion, uh, it, it's, um, it, we can do it quick and dirty, like really fast with people. And when people start researching the different dimensions in an implosion, it totally shifts their awareness. But we also do very, very um, deep involved implosions. They often take about eight months. Um, I'm gonna go to the next slide. And that's another thing that happens with me when I'm in presentation mode is I can't forward my ugh, slides. It's gonna be a drag. Okay. For some reason, my computer does not like to um, advance slides. That was out of the, we did the implosion as part of researching plastic bags. And we were um, one of the core, core organizations who led the bag ban. So it started with us, the, um, Department of the uh, Zero Waste and Litter um, Office that was Nick Esposito and with Maurice Sampson at Clean Water Action. 
And actually it was the third time the bag ban's been introduced and we were really behind that campaign with those two other groups. So for us, an implosion is often like the foundation for taking action. So we're gonna go into the um, drywall and dumping implosion. And one thing to understand about us is when we did this implosion, we didn't know what, what the result would be, like what's the action that we would take out of it. And we were specifically looking at C and D waste. The Climate Justice Initiative is a big project that we're working on. And in that trash circle, um, one of the people, Billy Dufala, brought the magnitude of C and D waste in Philly. But the reason why we um, picked drywall is because when we were out there evaluating the objects, it was the one most relevant to residents. So the part that might be most important to architects, we probably didn't go into very deeply because we're most interested in quality of life issues. Um, so there we are looking at different objects. You can see um, that's an air conditioner in Nick's hands. There's foam core on, foam, not foam core. I have drywall in my hand. You can see our objects laid out on the floor. We're at Revolution Recovery there. We have a bucket. We have, um, that's PVC pipe over there on the far end. So we're looking at various objects to select. We start by doing this residency at Revolution Recovery and selecting objects. And we used a matrix to pick the object. Like, is it relevant for climate justice and environmental justice? Does it connect to zero waste? Um, does it connect to actions, effort, or policy in Philly? So you can pick an object like PVC pipe, but if no one is doing anything about PVC pipe, it's not the right object. So we know that um, where there's synergy around an issue is uh, where we wanna go, where it's not just us working on it. So is the object topical and is it relatable to Philly residents? Is it relevant to them? And then we also asked, is it a renewable material? And um, we actually, did not answer that correctly about sheetrock, by the way, I, when I went back and looked at the notes. So um, there we are doing the implosion. We're in the sorting room. You can see the magnitude of uh, drywall that's coming into Revolution Recovery. And what Terrell, who's your fave trash man, told us is that in the dumping sites all over Philly, that's one of the big items. He says you open any plastic bag where there's a group of bags and there's gonna be drywall. Hmm. So this is the group. Gamar, do you wanna um, take this slide? Um, sure, so what we did is, um, I mean, you can see all the um, uh, brains in the room. <laughs> so we had Billy as an artist, Nick from Cir Circular Philly, a lot of researchers, activists, and a lot of uh, folks who, be, who have been working with this material, like Amanda Kaminsky from Building Product Ecosystem. Uh, there's Marianne Duffy. Hi, Marianne. Um, and uh, so what we did, well, I mean, I was absent that day because I was sick, but what, what the group did, they came together and they did um, sort of a quick implosion um, on that day. And then um, what, what, but first, we just wanted to explain to you what an implosion is. Um, I learned this technique um, a long while um, ago from uh, Professor Donna Haraway. Um, so we usually explode uh, materials to understand what they're made of, but we never implode and see what's behind, what's hidden behind objects and things. So uh, we do the implosion as a way of researching all the hidden connections, complexities behind an object. Um, so what we did is uh, when we looked at the drywall, it really um, helped us sort of situate um, the drywall within Philly, understand where it comes from, all the hidden connections behind it, especially its connection with dumping um, in Philly and the dumping crisis. It, the implosion exercise really gives you um, a, a look into all the things that you wouldn't necessarily see when you stare at an object. It helps you surface politics, uh, personal perspectives, ideologies, histories behind uh, the material. And it's a really in-depth and fascinating research method. Um, and you can include people from all uh, over 
the fields, like researchers, historians, etc. Um, so here's our um, sort of final implosion of the drywall and dumping. <laughs> uh, and we called it dumping in Philly and clues to solutions. All the orange uh, sections are sort of the issue that we are dealing with. And then the green areas are all those clues to solutions uh, mm -hmm. that we came up with. And this is not all the solutions, but some of the solutions. Um, so we wanted to go into details of each section on this um, implosion. Shari, do you wanna add something? Um, yeah, um, you see the little black bars, material, labor, context. Those are, implosions have dimensions. So you dig into it through like historical, educational, political, economic. But in then once a story emerges, that seems the most important story, um, we reorganize it. So there's an emergent story that then it's not just the um, specific uh, dimensions and everything is interconnected. So there's a lot of sorting. So we can start now with the, um, the center of our story. So I'll take this slide. And um, I think what's important is that C and D waste is one of the top short dump materials that um, I think drywall is the second, it's the second largest material found in it. You can see the glitter index is the map there and the red lining map is on top of that. So what you have is this um, historical disadvantaging and accumulated disadvantages that impact a neighborhood. And Ultimately, the people doing the cleaning are usually block captains. They're usually women over 40 from BIPOC communities. Um, you have CDCs and CLIP, but the burden on cleaning is often an unpaid burden in um, low wealth neighborhoods. Gamar, you wanna take this one? Yeah, so we started looking at uh, material extraction. So this, we do dove into the material world and we realized that uh, gypsum boards come from natural mined gypsum. Um, uh, and sometimes it comes from, uh, some, from sulfur capture from the coal power plant, um, from coal power plants, but the majority comes from natural gypsum that is mined. Needless to say, this causes environmental degradation. And also most of the time miners uh, come from vulnerable communities. Uh, this is a sort of a highly unregulated industry. So um, workers are in hazardous environments um, a lot of the time. And um, it is a big industry. There's like, uh, um, the US is one of the biggest in, um, producers of um, gypsum and gypsum drywall. So 21 million tons um, are produced a year, uh, gypsum drywall. So, uh, and also, I mean, you know, coal power plants are one of the top polluters um, and contributors to climate change. So it's not necessarily an industry we wanna uh, support. <laughs> Lamar, we have to go faster or okay. we won't get through this. Okay, so one thing to know about um, drywall is that there's unnecessary additives in it that make it non-recyclable. So in and of itself, it's actually an amazing material. There's issues with it, but it's, it's, it's recyclable. And the other thing to know about it is it's infinitely cheaper than plaster. What we don't know is the energy difference. Like if you have a plaster house versus a drywall house, we do know that plaster, when it gets wet, it recovers and drywall has to be replaced. Um, the cheapness of drywall is part of what makes a, taking down houses, it's one of the factors in all the demolition as opposed to remodeling. And you can, um, Lamar, you want this one? Yeah, you see that, um, uh, like Shari was saying, it is a lot cheaper to install, uh, to produce and install drywall. Uh, and then the, the labor is cheap and the material is cheap. And one of the reasons we have a demo boom in Philly is that is that it is cheaper to destroy something and uh, instead of uh, repurposing or um, um, uh, what's the word? Uh, remodel. remodel. Uh -huh, remodeling. <laughs> uh, so the, the cost, even though the cost of doing this is cheap, but the cost is really high on the people and the planet and 
um, our city is changing really quickly. So, um, so that's sort of the context of it. Um, even though it is a, it is a good material. And uh, a thing about Philly is right now the amount of demo that's going into our landfill, the, the amount of materials that could be diverted is not being diverted. So this huge problem with uh, volume. So um, this is a really important slide because one of the crazy things we found is that in Pennsylvania, um, there's a PA waste transporter authorization and it's only trucks of a certain size. So if they have a trailer, it's, I think that's when it's 17,000 pounds, 10,000, it's these huge trucks. So all the little trucks, like when you see all the little, the box trucks, the, the vans, the small pickup trucks, they actually don't have to have any kind of license. Um, so it also means that first of all, they're unregulated and second of all, they have to pay the same tipping fee as a giant um, hauler and it's not cost effective for them. So anyone can like be entrepreneurial, rent a little box truck and be the demo hauler. And what are they doing with that um, material? So those materials go to uh, waste transfer stations, be it revolution recovery, burns, um, and then um, the city produces a lot of um, uh, CND waste. Only the municipal waste um, is um, enough to fill up um, whole of FDR Park at the height of one at the height of a one story building every year. So. Um, and people think that it is cheaper to dispose of drywall than to recycle it. Amanda Kaminsky um, um, believes differently. So <laughs> we want to divert that uh, drywall from landfills and incineration and into uh, giving it a second life. Um, and needless to say, uh, landfills are um, polluters. Um, and then the sulfate that leaches into the, our waters and ground and also in, uh, that goes into the air is a highly pollutant material, polluting material. And then we don't, as you know, we don't have a, an infinite amount of landfill capacity. It, it says we have only 20 years, but I mean, that's not the solution. We have to stop uh, landfilling stuff. And also so I want you to note the 13... 0.2 million tons landfilled a year. That's um, a huge amount. Like, so the amount that's ending up in a landfill is not that far off the, from the amount that's being produced each year. And only a small fraction is being recycled right now. Wait, did it go past? Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, go ahead. No, I'm, we're saying that, you know, this is a linear economy, except the loop is closed, but with a very thin line, like Shari said, only 1.3% is recycled. So there is a closed loop, but it's not an uh, efficient closed loop. Um, there is a little bit of recycling. Amanda says we could recycle 30% instead of 1.3%. And then we can't uh, uh, use gypsum only for agricultural use in, in a form of its recycling. So we need to figure out ways of be a better recycling of gypsum into new drywall products or, or other uh, new products. And the technology is here. Everyone, they, they know how to do this. There is a, a problem between used and unused drywall in terms of recycling. Mm -hmm. So here are some of the um, proposed solutions. Um, it's actually Marianne that told us about the green tape that allows for disassembly and reuse. Um, the right now, if architects uh, design more efficiently, like with the size of drywall in mind, that would reduce the waste. There's another piece of it too, which is most builders don't want a source separation. They think it's going to um, cost more. So if you see down there in that bottom bubble on the left, you know they've done tests and it actually doesn't take more effort to do source separation. Instead of having two people going through and collecting everything, one person goes through first and collects the drywall and the other person follows and collects the rest of the debris 
There's also an issue with the timing of the drywall debris, because often it's at the end of construction, it's closer to the end when the big stuff has already been removed from the site, making it like this extra thing to take care of. Um, Kamar, should I keep going? Sure, uh, if you want so, to talk about the deconstruction. Yeah, so right now deconstruction, it is possible. There's only one game in town. Other cities have a deconstruction ordinance. So um, Seattle, Portland, Baltimore just got one. And basically there's an appraisal, then you deconstruct. Right now you get a tax deduction for it. And the tax deduction is actually greater. Like you, you save money deconstructing. However, it takes more time and we need more capacity to bring it up to scale. So those are things we could do at the prevention end. And I just wanna mention this, like when we think about dumping and trash, we think about um, education and awareness. We think about prevention, abatement and enforcement. And a lot of people think about enforcement. And at Trash Academy, we wanna do prevention. Like we want to um, think more circularly and more green. Uh, we, it's just very important not to just look at it as a problem of disposal because it's not, it's a problem of reducing disposal. So some of the things, when we show this to the community, say, what can we do right now? There is a um, dumping uh, form that when you <sighs> create a, um, a uh, building permit that you need, but there's no, it's just, you have to keep it on file for three years. No one ever asks for it. There's no enforcement around it. There's no accountability. So what people or developers, builders can do themselves is ask the hauler for their dumping receipts um, to know where the waste is going so they're not just dropping it illegally. Um, Terrell Hagler is, working on a preferred a vendor list. Um, and the Office of Sustainability is working on creating a facility for reused materials. Because apparently, as soon as you start to do this, uh, this um, deconstruction, a whole huge market pops up around it, like pretty seamlessly. Sometimes you have to work to create markets, but I think that the infrastructure for the materials is the big thing on this. And none of this stuff, according to Ellen and I, is easy. Um, go to the next one, Gamar. Do you want to do this one? Yeah, some of the suggestions, like uh, Shari was saying, we need to increase capacity for LNI to do this sort of work. And also, uh, we need to see those small haulers who are ending up dumping in neighborhoods to legitimize their businesses and then subsidize them and, or provide them vouchers to be able to dump in appropriate places and waste transportation stations or sanitation convenience centers. So our idea was like, why can't we allow small haulers to dump at convenience centers? centers um, uh, for, for a smaller fee. Um, and then, um, like Shari was saying, uh, we should require dumping receipts um, before you can issue certificate of occupancy um, and also make this process a little more accessible than it is right now and require to put these, these receipts um, on the building permits and dem demolition permits, um, like to show who you're hiring to, uh, to come and um, collect your waste material and where will it be dumped. So, so these are some of the things that are not there right now in the system. Um, and in terms of the convenience centers, having it as a point of sale, most cities have that. Like, so where are these guys gonna take this stuff? Like it's not cost effective to take it to revolution recovery or burns driving it out of the city, it's not likely they're gonna do it. Most cities allow them to pay to dump. And in Philly at the recycle center in Fairmount Park, we actually have that where they, they, they drive their trucks in, they weigh, they dump, they weigh their trucks on the way out, then they pay the fee. So we actually have a precedent and a system for it. Um, and the requiring a dumping receipt before issuing a certificate of occupancy, um, we know there's a lot of there's a lot of nuance in this stuff, but what we're looking at is you have to go all the way around the circle. Like you have to work at this on many levels. You can't just like deal with putting up cameras. 
Um, we actually know that one of the issues with putting up cameras and having people um, have violations is if you don't have a system that's super easy to use, more mm -hmm. like a ticketing system that doesn't have to go through the um, criminal justice system, that makes it easier to catch people. If you have a license for the haulers, then if they're found dumping illegally, they lose their license. So there are all these things are, there's subtlety in them and there's the need to look um, around the entire uh, circle. This is the back side of the poster. Let me look at the time, it's 8.28. So I don't think we'll go into the back side so that there's time for you to ask questions. We just wanna to point to one thing is we've been working in Kensington now for two years which is actually how we got focused on dumping because it's what the community wanted us to focus on. And we're starting a campaign. So the campaign is started with um, your fave trash man, clean water action and trash academy. So that QR code, as we take this um, poster around and this poster is coming out in the building, the built environment issue of grid on May 1st, we expect to get a lot of people taking a survey and there's also a letter for people to join the campaign because we are starting a dumping campaign. And then what we ask for in that dumping campaign will probably come out of all this work that we're doing now and all this negotiation with people. And I'm gonna stop the share so that you guys can ask questions. And, and I'm going to um, put trashacademy.org on uh, the chat so you can go and see all this with all the references, citations, the poster itself. Hey, hey, guys. Um, one thing that I think everybody would really love you to talk about is um, Greg Trainer and the Community Corps, Philadelphia oh, sure. Community Corps, because that's <clears throat> something where they can take action. And he actually spoke to our group as well. Um, do you want to do that? Let me put this right here back. So here it is, that's his thing at the top of the screen. The next slide is also just that. Okay. Sorry. Oh, uh, now my thing's not advancing, give me a second. Yeah, can you just, you know, talk about um, your work, you know, your conversations with Greg, and I, I just think wow. that it will be really relevant to how um, architects can, can um, be involved in this process of, you know, reclamation. I mean, we're really we're really interested in adaptive reuse and reclamation. And so um, I think if you just, I know that we're short on time, but that is a sort of a, an important area that we're looking at. Um, there you go. Yeah, so we spent a long time talking to Greg, he is, right now the only game in town around de deconstruction. It's very, very simple. Um, you go to his QR code and he has a list of um, recommended appraisers and they come out and evaluate the site. This is exactly how they do it in those cities that have it as an ordinance. And they, assess what you have there. They tell you what materials can be deconstructed and they give you an estimate of what it's going to um, result in, the kind of savings. Then you, they deconstruct your building and then the materials, when they're donated, that's when the tax savings is there. And if you look at the deconstruction and the demolition costs on that green um, band right there, you can see that the, um, that the, see the thing, the value of materials that can be donated came at 135,000. So the after-tax savings was 56,700. That is a significant um, savings by deconstructing. The other thing you're doing when you deconstruct is you're, you know, saving the environment, you're creating green jobs, you know, you're participating in a, um, it's also an environmental justice issue because we know that a lot of this stuff is going in, going, it would be an illegally dumped, of course, not all of it, but a, a percentage of it is. Um, and also I think, um, 
it just to me, there's like no reason not to do it. I can't, I can't talk about, I think developers would have a lot of the idea of delaying a project for a couple months to deconstruct. I think most people in our capitalist mindset think of that as a loss, you know, and I, I think that's a, a, a pretty big conversation because how do you measure the loss of time um, against the loss of the environment because really it is a fairly dire situation what's going on right now and dimensional lumber is like a huge problem environmentally so um, capturing the recapturing dimensional lumber recapturing you know doors uh, bricks um, there's so many things that can be recaptured so I think um, that's why we put this on the back of the poster is because it's action that can happen now. And I just wanna say deconstruction is not one plus one to dumping, but it's about thinking about all of the systems and um, our mindset. Thank you so much for that wonderful presentation. We did have one question in the chat that I think we have some time for. Um, so I'll just read it. Are there statistics on the distinction between drywall cutoffs and clean waste versus drywall from demolition? Presumably the second is more difficult to recycle and reuse. Kamora, I don't think we have statistics on that, do you? Um, no, we don't, but I'm going to quickly go to um, Building Product e Ecosystems website. Maybe Amanda does have, um, uh, so that would definitely be a question for Amanda Kaminsky. Um, I talked to Fern from Revolution Recovery about, about it about a week or two ago, and she said that um, at Revolution Recovery, you know, their business started with uh, the cutoffs of drywall. And so she thinks eventually that will be recyclable, be used, but one of the problems are the additives. And one thing we didn't mention is at one point they added asbestos to um, drywall. They actually, the USG gypsum has the biggest trust fund for asbestos um, related diseases of any industry because for many years they put asbestos in it. So I think the um, used, Drywall is, I mean, asbestos was in both unused and used, but I think the, um, they actually think that uh, um, this will be worked out and they're sort of awaiting it to happen. You know, it's expected to happen because as the landfills fill up, um, you know, Philly's landfill was scheduled to fill up in about seven years and they just announced they're going to mm -hmm. build a new landfill. About um, in February this year, they announced that. Yeah, and Amanda does have the percentages, and it's uh, pretty cool. I put it in the chat. You see the different percentages of the, the drywall that comes out um, from demo scraps, from factory scraps, from um, um, new construction. So she does have that um, specific numbering. Uh, we didn't find, it, um, find the need to include that in our poster, but that information is definitely there. I would say they want to, that's right, um, they want to use demo scrap and cement manufacturing. Mm -hmm. That would, um, yeah, and cement's a whole other, I'm sure you guys know, it's a huge problem environmentally. I think it's like something like 8% of climate change is from cement production. It's pretty high um, because of the heat used. Any other questions? I do have a quick question. Um, this is an amazing presentation. Thank you so much. Um, I, I, I loved it. Uh, I am wondering, sorry, this is a very specific question, but I am wondering, and you don't have to share your secret, but your graphics to put the poster together, I feel like were amazing and a really great way to, to really place things and, and show relationships between processes. Um, do you mind sharing how, did you just create those graphics uh, just by yourself or did you use a certain software? 
I'll let the more tell you. <laughs> so these beautiful drawings are made by Shari. Um, oh and goodness. I put it all together on Illustrator, but I didn't do it alone. So Shari and I have been uh, in discussion for months and months over the phone, Zoom. <laughs> you should see the first iteration a few months, months back to this. So this has been a labor of love with a lot of time going into it and then changing the scale of the arrow. To, it's, it's, it's insane, but it has been a labor of like, oh, I don't know how many months, Shari. When did we start this? I don't know, December. So we did the research with the group in um, September and then, it, I don't know, September, October and December. And so mm -hmm. we've taken it back to that implosion group over and over again. We've taken it to the community. So every, we've taken it to LNI, the Office of Sustainability, to Kath, Catherine Gilmer Richardson's policy director. So we take it around the people. We get feedback and pushback and we clarify. So mm -hmm. that emergent story and like the story we elected to focus on, which wasn't really about recycling drywall, our story is about how to get it off the streets of Philly mm -hmm. um, because we can impact and work with city government. We thought as Trash Academy, we can't really impact industry. That's not who we are. That's not who our people are. And it's, I mean, it's totally possible. It's just not our cup of tea. So um, everyone helps us get the story right um, and the story they want to see and what resonates with them. So it's very iterative. There's been a lot of people. It's, it's um, oh, we had a huge takedown on the back of the poster on Circular Philly. Marianne was at the center of it because they say raw material goes into circular. So when you define raw material for manufacturing. It's not raw coming out of the earth. It's just the material needed. And so there was a whole thing about the um, renewable, um, extracted and re, what's it called? Not reclaimed, but there's another word for it um, the, about how that goes into circularity. So we reached our conclusions through uh, a lot, a lot of, a lot of people's brains went into this. So there's block captains and people who are doing the cleanup who are a part of this conversation. There's people who are really about, um, like say Nick Esposito and Maurice Sampson are waste experts who deal with, re Maurice is a recycling expert at the level of recycling in the city. You know, Nick is a zero waste circularity expert. So um, Terrell, was a sanitation worker. So he's like the lived experience. So we had all the different people going yes, no, and like duking it out. So that's how we make it clear. It make the story clear is it's a, it's a collaborative, it's a horizontal collaboration. And just, just so you know, we have done implosions where it's not one person doing the drawing. In Trash Academy, the whole group does the drawings. Like when we're doing with a, when we have a whole cohort, this was a little different because we formed a special group around C and D waste to do this together. It was a little more expert than say Trash Academy is a lot of neighbors, and it's right. You know, we work hard on developing knowledge. So this is how we develop the expertise to now go around talking to you guys is great, but we're going to two community events tomorrow. Um, we're uh, doing a teaching with teachers on Saturday. We're going to Villanova and presenting this. So what starts to happen is we get asked to present it and we'll build a cohort that goes to the next level with this that develops um, policy and um, yeah, policy action for the city. Once there's a bill introduced, Trash Academy has to step back. We can only do education awareness because we are part of the city a little bit, a small part of mural arts and we can't lobby. So um, if there's any kind of bill, then we are just educational and awareness. But right now we can develop a campaign and get mm -hmm. everyone on board to have momentum for change. And one thing we can tell you is there's huge um, interest. Like LNI is like, yeah, let's do it. You know, a Catherine Gilmore Richardson, give us your questions. So we can ask them at the budget hearing. Everyone is ready 
for this because the dumping is uh, epidemic in Philadelphia right now. It's disgusting what people in low wealth neighborhoods are living with. You can't imagine what it's like for them every day and they clean the same block over and over again. It's a nightmare for them to live in their neighborhoods that are being so, um, like being dumped on is like an emotional and um, it's like your human worth, like you're dumping on me. It is like the worst message ever. Like I'm not worth anything you're dumping on me. And everyone knows that. It's not hidden from the people in those neighborhoods where they're being dumped on. It's very, very real. It is a huge environmental justice issue. And it seems like it's just that no one in um, city government has had the stamina to face it. It's like, because it's unseen and who's the burden on? Yeah, and Shari, and most of the time it's CND waste also, and, or, or, or waste that comes from renovations and things Clean like that. So too. the building industry, yeah, like architects, con contractors uh, need to be aware of this issue because this is not any other type of material. This is CND waste. So we should be mindful from the very beginning of the process of building to make sure that this waste doesn't go onto people's sidewalks. And Well, thank you both for coming today. And this, this is just so enlightening. I guarantee you every single one of us architects, engineers, sustainability experts, whatever we are, um, uh, fully get behind you on this issue. And there are a lot of synergies between our, what you presented today and our environmental justice policy and advocacy, zero waste um, groups. And so however we can continue to collaborate and support um, this wonderful effort, you know, please stay in touch and um, We'd absolutely love the opportunity to continue this conversation and support your efforts however we can. We're talking to a lot of the same people and so it just feels, it feels great to have a partner in this issue as well. I know you guys are doing really wonderful things. So thank you again for coming today. Well, um, thanks for having us and we'll send you the letter to join and support the campaign. I mean, last time all the big environmental groups, neighborhood groups, everyone joined and then there's a steering committee um, once every two weeks as we develop the agenda to push city government to make change. So we'll be sure, we're hoping that letter gets approved tonight and we can start sharing it with people because it would be great to have your guys' names on the campaign and mm -hmm. have a representative in the meetings and so that we fill out around that circle. So it's multidisciplinary, all, it's a diverse, diverse group that's saying this has to stop. Yeah, and trashacademy.org is the best place is a good place to start because the um, survey's there, the, the poster's there. Um, and the letter should be there tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> We're okay. hoping it gets approved tonight. So thank you for having thank us. Thank you. No, thank you both so much. This was amazing.